Thank you, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. And, you know, it's one of the probably last sessions of the day, but it's so much full of variety that it's keeping all of us totally glued to the screen. So topic which uh, Professor Akul gave me is about macular choroditis, how to suspect and manage. The first question was how to suspect and when to suspect. It's very simple, choroditis is deep. You can see overlying vessels very clearly. And because of the sheer anatomy of the choroid, the choroditis is going to have a kind of expression. It can be either unifocal or multifocal or diffuse. And this is the example of multifocal where you see many patches of choroditis, which over a period of time may become confluent and form a diffuse kind of choroditis. Sometimes, especially for the beginner and the students, if you are in doubt, whether it is a choroditis or retinitis, it's always a good idea to look at the OCT and fluorescing. Choroditis is always hypo in the early phase, becoming hyper in the late phase, and may have a pocket of fluid or serous detachment associated with it. Do OCT and OCT would show you the choroditis where choroid is primarily involved. For example, in this patient who has a choroidal granuloma, you can see the choroid elevated and you can see on response to steroids, uh, sorry, response to therapy coming back. The changes which are happening in the retina are mostly in the outer retina and they overlie an area of choroidal bump, which is seen very well on OCT. Now, when should you not suspect choroditis? One, if you are seeing the lesion, which is fluffy white, which is obscuring the vessels, which is margins are not so distinct, and there may be overlying vitreitis. Now, this is the kind of the lesion, which is retinitis. So please do not think of the differential diagnosis of choroditis in these lesions. So what should you do if you are in doubt? Just do an OCT. And here the OCT shows beautifully that there is involvement of inner retina primarily. And whatever is happening in the choroid, it's a kind of secondary to the retina and not the other way around that we saw in choroditis. Fluorescein angiography may show hyper to increasing hyper, but it's not as characteristic as in choroditis. Why is it important to know? Now look at this patient. The patient presented to original ophthalmologist with this lesion. At this time, he was labeled as choroditis, treated with steroids. And by the time he came to us, he had a diffuse lesion like this. It was, we actually did a vitrectomy because it was so confusing at that particular time and it was toxoplasmosis. So if this had been recognized as toxoplasmosis, it's just a clinical diagnosis. You would have saved the vision in this particular eye with very simple, straightforward treatment. When not to expect is when you have these subretinal deposits which have a linear configuration like this. For example, this patient was diagnosed as TB choroditis and was treated with anti-TB drugs and high dose steroids. So patient came to us after three months of the treatment with the reason that she's not responding to therapy. Now, if we look at the configuration this is not how the choroidal architecture would be. This is not how the anatomy of the choroid will be. So choroditis is not going to be linear like this. This was the nasal, which again showed subretinal fibrin. And of course, the fluorescein confirmed that it was central serous choreoretinopathy, which was multifocal. We just stopped steroids and everything, and the patient responded. Now, I was kind of intrigued. Was it TB to begin with and then steroids induced CSC? Or was it just a fibrinous variety of CSC that was confused by the ophthalmologist as TB? 
So I asked him to get his previous pictures. And as you can see, before starting treatment, he had these lesions, which were increasing hyperfluorescent dots. So this is not the fluorescent or the clinical picture of choroiditis. So these things are very, very distinct and should not be confused. Then comes sometimes a subretinal deposit. So if you have a subretinal deposit, please do not suspect choroiditis because these are the ones which are going to be masquerade. Now this patient had leukemia. Subretinal deposits like this one, again, if on OCT you are seeing something beneath the RPE, again, never ever think of the differentials of choroiditis. These are the patients who are very likely to have lymphomas or other masculines. So now is that you have suspected the choroiditis, but what do you do next? So once you are sure that it is choroiditis, there is important to know that in choroiditis, there is a very close call between being infective versus non-infective. So you ask yourself a couple of questions, which I have listed here. Is it choroiditis or retinochoroiditis? OCT, fluorescein, and of course your clinical judgment would help. Is there associated involvement of optic nerve head or retinal vessel? Do these clinical features fit into any of the entities that you know? Pay attention to associated anterior segment inflammation, vitritis, associated CNVs. Is it unifocal, multifocal, unilateral, bilateral, any systemic disease? And is it recurrent? What is very important, if it is recurrent, what was the previous episode like? And is it responding the way it should be responding? I gave you this example. Now let's see how this algorithm fits into it. This is a 29-year-old lady. She had received intravitreal triamcelone, oral steroids, ATT, for almost eight months. And when she came to us, her visual acuity was counting fitness. Well, is it retinochoroiditis? Well, this is retinochoroiditis. It's not choroiditis primarily. There was associated vitritis. It's an immune competent patient and it's unilateral disease. But what is very important is to ask patients and to spend some time because by and large, they are carrying this huge pile with them and we are impatient people. We don't even look at it. You say, okay, forget it. Go and get your ICG and OCT done. No, if you are in uveitis, that file, some one page in that file may give you the entire story. So what was the past episode like? You just look at the past episode and you look at it and you say, oh, this is toxo. Otherwise, if I had not seen the past episode, I would go with viral lymphoma and you know so many other possibilities in mind. And of course, as I told you, her past episode, actually we saw it much later before that, she had already undergone a diagnostic vitrectomy because we had a huge list of differentials and his, her vitreous shows a cyst of toxo sitting there. Just a last case to show an example of how to work up this patients, a 27 year old man, decreased vision, sudden onset, painless, progressive. He also had some complaints about redness and pain for the six days after the onset of decreased vision. So we look at it, we know it is choroiditis, there is vitreitis, there is very papillary involvement, choroiditis is multifocal, it's unilateral. Now what is that episode of pain? He has a component of scleritis to it. Now, scleritis with choroiditis, you know, uh, multifocal choroiditis, vitreitis, scleritis, you tend to think more about infective than non-infective and TB will top the list. So we do the ICG fluorescein just to document the activity and the lesion and the extent. And of course the ICG shows very classical serpiginous like choroiditis and Montius is very significantly positive. Pontiferon is positive on CT chest. He has some mediastinal load, uh, nodes and EBUS is positive for TB. So 
this is how the diagnosis can be made by using very simple algorithms and you can see good response to treatment. So in nutshell, if it is choroiditis, look whether it is diffuse or multifocal. If it is diffuse, if it is primarily retina involvement, it could be toxo or viral. If it is primarily choroidal involvement and looks like serpiginous, rule out all the causes for infective, but in the meantime, be careful that it could just be an autoimmune variety, which has a very different phenotype. Yeah, I'm just finishing. If it is multifocal, there could be a very classic phenotype, big mutes, MP. Uh, there is no need to investigate these classic phenotypes because they are very classical, investigate only if patient is not responding. However, anytime you see a atypical phenotype which doesn't fit, always, always investigate these patients with choroiditis. Thank you very much and thank you, sir, once again for the kind invite.